Martin Luther, the Reformation and Islam. Have you ever wondered what caused the Reformation to take off in Europe back in the 1500s? My name is Rudy Harnish, and I welcome you to this three-part series. This is part number one, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and Islam. 500 years ago on that memorable day in the 16th century, 1517, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Have you ever wondered why did he do that? He posted his 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg as a result of what had been taking place previously. The Bible says in Psalms 138 verse 2, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. There were no Bibles back in those days readily available. You had to search high and low in order to find a Bible. Do you treasure your Bible? I hope you do, because this is a story of how the Bible came into the hands of the common people. Martin Luther, born November 10, 1483, in a little village called Eisleben, Saxony, Germany. And he died February 18, 1546, also in Eisleben. He was a German theologian and a religious reformer who was the catalyst of the 16th century Protestant Reformation. My son and I landed in Leipzig, Germany some two years ago before the celebration of the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And as we landed there and as we drove around, we saw all these villages with these red roofs and it's very beautiful, very picturesque as we drove through the countryside. Here you have a map of Europe and Germany is in the yellow. Here you have a close-up of Germany and the part in the orange, the lower section of the orange, is where the Reformation got started with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was born in Eisleben, as we've mentioned. It's also called Lutherstadt or Luthertown. Well, Martin Luther, he was voted by the Associated Press to be the third most influential person in the last 1,000 years. He was the man that brought the Bible back to the common people in their language in Germany. Well, as we drove into Eisleben, we saw this home. This is the home where Martin Luther was born. As we looked inside this humble home, we saw a reproduction of what the home life possibly looked like in that, in that time of Martin Luther. Ten minutes from this home is another home. Sixty-five years ago, my father and his family fled Eastern Europe in the aftermath of World War II due to the Soviet occupation of Eastern Germany. In 1954, my father's home, which is just a 10-minute drive from Eisleben, Germany, where Martin Luther was born. I myself grew up in a Lutheran home. My family did not miss a single Sunday. That family consisted up on the right-hand side, my father and mother, and the center, my grandfather, and to the left there, my grandmother. They lived there in, in Riechstedt, Germany which is so close to where Martin Luther's home was. As I drove around Riechstedt, the old German uh, church is still there, the Lutheran church of that village. It is over 800 years old. It used to be a Roman Catholic church. And then 500 years ago, the Reformation swept through and they threw out the idols and so forth. And it became a Lutheran church. I walked inside that church and I was amazed at how old this, this building had been. The altars are still there, and the, the balcony and the seating, all that is still there. The placard outside the front mentions that a church was over 800 years old. Well, I drove around with some friends of ours there in that village to look at the old farmstead that my father and mother and my grandparents had fled. It was just amazing to go back and to see where my father and mother had lived and my grandparents. In the wagon was a lady. That's the lady that was pictured in that black and white picture. So we drove around together 65 years later to visit the old homestead. Part of the orchard that was there at my grandfather's time is still there. And this is what's left of the fence. Well, what does this have to do with the Reformation? Actually, quite a bit. If you look at the map there, the two arrows, one arrow shows Eisleben 
and the other arrow shows where my father's farm was. And so they're very close together. Getting back to Martin Luther and his parents, Johann and Margaret Luther were the parents of Martin Luther. And uh, Johann Luther was an honest and upright man. He was diligent in business. It says he was frank and firm in character. Martin Luther's father would often kneel at the child's bedside and fervently pray out loud, begging the Lord that his son might remember his name and one day contribute to the propagation of the truth. Young Martin Luther was sent to the Latin school in Mansfield. Back in those days, if you wanted to amount to anything, you had to learn Latin because that was the language of the upper class. Here the family had moved from Eisleben some years before, and here's where Martin had a difficult time as he went to school. They had little money, and so young Martin had to sing from home to home at times so he could get food. He understood what poverty was. And every time he heard the name of Jesus spoken, he turned pale with a fright, for the Savior had only been represented to him as an offended judge. And so he had a great fear for God and for Jesus. He was totally alien to true religion. He had never heard the glad tidings of the gospel and the joy which it afterwards he felt when he finally learned to know him who is the meek and lowly Savior. He didn't realize that Jesus is pictured as a tender shepherd. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, it says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. This hardly sounds like someone who is an offended judge. And then we have in Ezekiel 34, 16, it says, God is speaking, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. In John chapter 10, verse 11, those famous words, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And in Matthew 25, 35, it tells us, I was a stranger and you took me in. Well, Martin Luther was taken by his father uh, to school from day to day and he would carry him to school. And uh, Martin had a very difficult time at school. One account says that the schoolmaster flogged him 15 times successfully one morning. These are the hard lessons he learned in the school of Latin. Hans Luther, or Johann Luther, wished his son Martin to become an attorney, a lawyer. And so after his Latin experience at the school, he sent him to the University of Erfurt. At the age of 18, he walked through these arches to the University of Erfurt. We went to Erfurt, walked through the halls and through the schoolrooms where Martin, no doubt, had also walked. He was an excellent student. He was a bright and a deep thinker, and he had a love for knowledge, which the university was able to provide. Because Martin Luther loved books just like his father, he would often be found at the university library. After being in the university for about two years one day, he is poring over the books at the university, and he comes across a Bible. It was a rare book in those times, unknown. And this is what he said, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. He had heard of fragments of scripture at church Sunday after ch Sunday. And he thought this was all there was of scripture. But now he held in his hands a complete Bible. And he said to himself, Oh, that I could have a book like this for myself one day. Well, he obtained the Master of Arts, or he became the Doctor of Philosophy from the most renowned University of Germany there in Erfurt. During a break in his school, he pays a visit to his parents at Mansfield, which wasn't too terribly far away. And he was returning to Erfurt as he was coming back from his parents. And as he nears the city, 
A suddenly black clouds gathered overhead, and it began to thunder and lightning in an awful manner. In fact, a bolt of lightning fell at his feet. Some accounts say that he was thrown down. He thought the great judge had descended in this cloud, and so he lay momentarily expecting death. In this terror, he vowed that should God spare his life, he would devote his life to his service. The lightning ceased, the thunders rolled past, and Martin Luther, rising from the ground, pursued his journey with solemn steps, soon entered the gates of Erfurt. We were there in Germany that spring day. The roses were blooming during this time, and we actually saw a storm that was taking place right at the place where it was believed that Martin Luther was struck or nearly struck by lightning. Now they have a stone monument erected in that very spot. And we visited it there, and there it has it in, in German, that when this happened, he was praying to St. Anne to, for help through this storm. And if she granted him his wish, his prayer, that he would become a monk. So Martin Luther, on July 17, 1505, he entered the monastic orders of the Augustinian monks of Erfurt, Germany, and through the gates of this massive church enters Martin Luther. It's a magnificent building to think that those folks over 500 years ago and longer built these magnificent structures. Well, Martin Luther walked straight into the Augustinian convent on the 17th of July, 1505, he knocks at the gate, the door is opened, and he enters. To Luther, groaning under sin and seeking deliverance by the works of the law, that monastery, so quiet, so holy, so near to heaven, he thought, seemed a very paradise. We walk through the very halls of that magnificent church. His friends and many members of the university assembled at the gates of the monastery and waited there for two whole days in hope of seeing Martin Luther and trying to persuade him to retrace his steps. Luther didn't even come to the gate, though he knew they were there, that magnificent chapel. We beheld there. It's just an amazing work of art. When the tidings reached Manfield, his parents, the surprise and disappointment and the rage of Luther's father was great. He had toiled night and day to be able to educate his son to become an attorney. He had seen him with one academical honor after another, wearing the highest dignitaries of the state. And in a moment, all these hopes had been swept away. All had ended in a monk's hood and cowl. Johann Luther declared that nothing of his should his son ever inherit. It was a huge disappointment for his father. As we looked around that monastery, you could see the high carved seats where the important prelates and dignitaries of the church sat while the common people sat far below. After Luther was made a monk, he was given this church at his parish this is the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany. This is the pulpit from which thousands of sermons were preached by Martin Luther. And this is what the inside of that church looks like today. He was given an assignment one day to visit Rome. And so Martin Luther was sent to the Vatican. And as he is going up this staircase on his knees and praying, a voice shouted out to him as if he heard it, and it said, it is written, the just shall live by faith. At that point, Martin Luther bolted from the scene. Well, back in those days, there was a fire in the Mansfield church. And Johann Luther, as well as some of the other church members, had been responsible for repairing this church. And this is what the mindset was of those days. We can't blame them. They didn't have the Bible. But they made an appeal um, to the Mansfield Parish Church, to the Archbishop of Albright. And the appeal was that 
since they renovated this church after the fire, in return for making all these donations for the construction of the church, the faithful received an indulgence remitting time in purgatory. Ledner the priest and Hans Luther, the representative of the city, had requested this. So because of all their time and energy and the funds they put into reconstructing this church, and they asked for remitting time in purgatory. Such was the idea back in those days. You see, they didn't have the Bible because the Bible had been banned hundreds of years prior to this. The Church Council of Toulouse in 1299 stated this, We prohibit also that the laity should not be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament. We most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. So that's why Hans Luther and the church members and many others during those days, they did not know truth from error. They didn't have the Bible. Well, during that time, the sale of indulgences came in. A man by the name of Johann Tetzel, he was commissioned by Rome to sell indulgences. They wanted to, the new Pope, Leo X, he wanted to beautify Rome, and the church at St. Peter's had fallen into disrepair, and so it would take millions to, to make this happen, to restore it, and so it was resolved to have a special sale of indulgences in all the countries of Europe. And so it would be, according to Rome, a win-win situation. From the seven hills of Rome would flow a river of spiritual blessings to the people in Europe, and to Rome would flow back a river of gold. The arrangements were made for the opening of this great indulgence market. The license to sell it in different countries was sold to the highest bidder and had to be paid beforehand to the pontiff. So the indulgences in Germany were farmed out to Albert, the Archbishop of Mainz. And so the Archbishop sought out a suitable person to be able to sell these indulgences in Germany. And he found just such an individual by a, in a Dominican monk by the name of Johann Tetzel. He was the son of a goldsmith from Leipzig. Tetzel lacked no quality necessary for the success in this scandalous occupation. He had a voice of a town crier and the eloquence to go with it. He would line up a procession and move from place to place and had a great red cross which he himself would carry and he would go in front of the procession and then on the rear came the mules laden with bales of pardons to be given out to those who would buy the indulgences. This is what he would say, the grace of God and the Holy Father was at your gate. The gates of heaven were now opened. The tall red cross with all the spiritual riches was coming to the people. And so this procession of Tetzel and all those with him advanced amid the beating of drums, the waving of flags, the blaze of tapers and the pealing of bells. As he entered the city, Tetzel and his company went straight to the cathedrals. Crowds would press in and fill the church. Tetzel said, indulgences are the most precious and the most noble of God's gifts. He bade the people think what it was that had come to them. Never before in their times, nor in the times of their fathers, had there been a day of privilege like this. Never before had the gates of paradise been opened so widely. He said, press in now and come, Buy while the market lasts, shouted the Dominican. Should that cross be taken down, the market will close. Heaven will depart, and then you will begin to knock and to bewail your folly in neglecting to avail yourself of the blessings which shall then have gone beyond your reach. Such was the pressure of Johann Tetzel before the crowds of people. He said in this cross, pointing to his red cross, it has as much if efficacy as the very cross of Christ. Come, he said, I will give you letters all properly sealed by which even the sins which you intend to commit may be pardoned. I would not change my privileges, said Tetzel, for those of St. Peter in heaven, 
for I have saved more souls by my indulgences than the apostle did by his sermons. But more than this, Tetzel said, indulgences avail not only for the living, but for the dead. Priest, noble, merchant, wife and youth, maiden, he appeals, do you not hear your parents and your other friends who are dead and who cry from the bottom of the abyss? We are suffering a horrible torments. A trifling alms would deliver us. You can give it, and you will not. These were the words that were shouted in a voice like thunder by the monk. It made the hearers shudder. At the very instant, continues Tetzel, that the money rattles at the bottom of the chest, the soul escapes from purgatory and flies liberated to heaven. Now you can ransom so many souls, said Tetzel, yet you are stiff-necked and thoughtless men. With only twelve groats you can deliver your father from purgatory, yet you are ungrateful enough not to save him. I shall be justified in the day of judgment, but you, you, he told the crowd, will be punished, so much the more severely for having neglected so great salvation. I declare to you, though you have but a single coat, you ought to strip it off and sell it in order to obtain this grace. The Lord our God no longer reigns. He has resigned all power to the Pope. Such were the words by Johann Tetzel. Well, Frederick the Wise, the Elector of Saxony, he was the king of Germany in that time, and he would not allow Tetzel in his region because he, he understood something of the farce that had happened here, and he did not trust it. And so the closest that Johann Tetzel could come to the Frederick of Wise, the Elector of Saxony, was in Jotterbog, a few miles from Wittenberg, where the church of Martin Luther was. We went to Jotterbog, Germany. We went there because there was something in Jotterbog we wanted to see. Johann Tetzel had been there 500 years before at this very church where he was selling his indulgences, the Nikolai Kirche of Jotterbog, the Nikolai Church of Jotterbog. There was something there we wanted to see. And so when we went through the doors of the Nikolai Church, we asked, is Johann Tetzel's box here? They said, yes. And they proceeded to take us to this room where we saw Johann Tetzel's box. I was there personally. And we, we opened this large chest. And there is a picture of my son Johann sitting on Tetzel's box. Remember, Tetzel said indulgences are the most precious and the most noble of God's gifts. Come, he said, and I will give you letters, all properly sealed, by which even sins that you intend to commit may be pardoned. This saying was said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. He had been given this virtue by the apostolic power of Rome, he says, to absolve thee from whatever sin you might have. Well, there were several stories that came out of the sale of the indulgences, and one specifically was of the shoemaker and his wife. You see, the indulgence merchant had visited Hagenau in 1517, and the wife of a shoemaker, taking advantage of the authorization given to Johann Tetzel, she had procured a letter of indulgence, contrary to her husband's wishes. She had paid a gold florin, unfortunately. The wife died shortly thereafter. As the husband had not caused a mass to be said for her soul, the priest charged him with contempt of religion, and the magistrate of Haganau summoned the shoemaker to appear in court. The shoemaker put his wife's indulgence in his pocket, went to answer the accusation. Is your wife dead? asked the magistrate. Yes, replied he. What have you done for her? I have buried her body 
and commended her soul to God. But have you had a mass said for the repose of her soul? To this the shoemaker said, I have not. It was of no use. She entered heaven at the moment of her death. How do you know that? The magistrate returned. Here is proof, he said. As he said these words, he drew the indulgence from his pocket, and the magistrate, in the presence of the priest, read in so many words that at the moment of her death, the woman who had received it would not go into purgatory, but would at once enter into heaven. If the reverend gentleman maintains that a mass is still necessary, added the widower, my wife has been deceived by our most holy father, the Pope. If she has not been deceived, it is the priest who deceives me. There was no reply to this, and the shoemaker was acquitted. Then there's a story from Zikau and the cemetery. He had gone there and he set up his red cross to sell indulgences in Zikau, and the worthy parishioners had hastened to drop into his strong box the money that would deliver them from purgatory. And he was about to leave with a well-stored purse, it says, when on the eve of his departure, the chaplains and the acolytes asked him for a farewell supper. Those are the ones that helped him with his sale of indulgences. And the request was just. But he thought, how could I contrive it? The money was already counted and sealed up. On the morrow, on the following morning, he caused the great bell of the church to be toiled. The crowd rushed into the church. Each one imagined something extraordinary had happened, seeing that the business was over. Tetzel said, I had resolved to depart this morning, but last night I was awakened by groans. I listened attentively. They came from the cemetery. Alas, it was some poor soul calling upon me and earnestly entreating me to deliver it from the torments by which it was consumed. I shall stay, therefore, one day longer, he said, in order to move the compassion of all Christian hearts in favor of this unhappy soul. I myself, said Tetzel, will be the first to give, and he who does not follow my example will merit condemnation. What heart would not have replied to this appeal? Who knows? Besides, what soul it is thus crying from the cemetery? The offerings, it says, were abundant, and Tetzel entertained the chaplains and their acolytes with a joyous feast, all at the expense which was defrayed by the offerings given in behalf of the soul of the cemetery in Zikau. Such were the stories told by Tetzel. So the people flocked in crowds from Wittenberg to the indulgence market of Jotterbog. There is one story that stands out for them all. For I had wondered, why was Tetzel's box still in Germany? And I found the story of the nobleman and his purchase. You see, a Saxon nobleman who had heard Tetzel at Leipzig, he was much displeased by his falsehoods. He approached the monk and he asked him if he had the power of pardoning sins that men have an intention of committing. Most assuredly, replied Tetzel, I have received full powers from His Holiness the Pope for that purpose. Well then, answered the knight, I am desirous of taking a slight revenge on one of my enemies. Without endangering his life, I will give you ten crowns, said the nobleman if you will give me a letter of indulgence that shall fully justify me. Tetzel made some objections. They came, however, to an agreement by the aid of 30 crowns, and the nobleman was received his indulgence. The monk quitted Leipzig shortly thereafter, and the nobleman and his attendants lay in wait for him in a wood between Jotterbog and Tremblin. They fell upon him, and they gave Tetzel a slight beating, and the nobleman took away the well-stored indulgence chest the inquisitor was carrying with him. Tetzel made a violent outcry and carried his complaint before the courts. 
But the nobleman showed the letter which Tetzel had signed himself, which exempted him beforehand from every penalty. Duke George, whom this action had at first exceedingly exasperated, no sooner read the document than he ordered the accused to be acquitted. And so the nobleman was acquitted of his deed of stealing Tetzel's box. And I believe that's why it's still in Germany. Well, Frederick the Wise of Germany had a dream. And I would like to relate to you the dream. The festival of all saints was approaching. The elector Frederick of Saxony was at his palace of Schweinitz from Wittenberg, it's just a little ways, on October 31st, early in the morning, being with his brother Duke John, who was then co-regent, who reigned alone after his death. With his chancellor, the elector said, I must tell you a dream, brother, which I had last night, of which I should like to know the meaning. <clears throat> it is so firmly graven in my memory that I should never forget it, even if I were to live a thousand years, for it came three times and always with new circumstances. Duke John, was it a good dream or a bad dream? The elector said, I cannot tell, God knows. Duke John asks, do not be uneasy about it, let me hear it. The elector, I have gone, I went to bed last night. The elector, having gone to bed last night, tired and dispirited, dispirited I soon fell asleep after saying my prayers and slept calmly for about two hours and a half, and then awoke. All kinds of thoughts occupied me till midnight. I reflected how I should keep the festival of all saints. I prayed for the wretched souls in purgatory. I begged that God would direct me, my counsels and my people, according to the faith. I then fell asleep again and dreamt that the Almighty sent me a monk who was a true son of Paul the Apostle. He was accompanied by all the saints in obedience to God's command to bear him a testimony. And he assured me that he did not come with any fraudulent design, that all he should do was conformable to the will of God. They asked my gracious permission to let him write something on the doors of the palace chapel at Wittenberg, which I conceded through my chancellor. Upon this, the monk repaired thither and began to write. So large were the characters that I could read from Schweinitz what he was writing. The pen he used was so long, and its extremity reached all the way as far as Rome, where it pierced the ears of a lion, which lay there and shook the triple crown on the Pope's head. All the cardinals and the princes ran up hastily and endeavored to support it, you and I both, he said, tendered our assistance. I stretched out my arm that moment. I awoke with my arm extended in great alarm and very angry with this monk who could not guide his pen better. I recovered myself a little and thought it was only a dream. I was still half asleep and once more closed my eyes. The dream came again. The lion was still disturbed by the pen and began to roar with all his might until the whole city of Rome and all the states of the Holy Empire ran up to know what was the matter. The Pope called upon us to oppose this monk and addressed himself particularly to me because the friar was living in my dominions. I again awoke, repeated the Lord's Prayer, and treated God to preserve his holiness and fell asleep. And then a third time I dreamt that all the princes of the empire and we along with them hastened to Rome and endeavored one after another to break this pen. But the greater our exertions, the stronger it became. It crackled as if it had been made of iron. We gave up as hopeless. I then asked a monk, for I was now at Rome, where did he get that pen and how it came to be so strong? The pen, replied the monk, belonged to a Bohemian goose a hundred years old. I had it from one of my old schoolmasters. It is so strong because no one can take the pith out of it, and I myself am quite astonished at it. 
On a sudden, I heard a loud cry, and from the monk's long pen had issued a host of other pens. I awoke a third time, and it was daylight. Duke John asked the Chancellor, What is your opinion on this, Mr. Chancellor? Should we rack our brains to discover the interpretation of this dream? God will surely direct everything in his own glory. To this the Elector said, May our God be faithful to do even so. Still, I shall never forget this dream. I have thought of one interpretation, but I shall keep it to myself. Time will show, perhaps, whether I have conjectured rightly. And thus passed the morning of the 31st of October at Schweinitz, 1517. The Elector of Saxony in his dream. If you want to know the aftermath of what happened, you'll have to listen and watch part number two. Remember this verse from the Bible, Luke 4.4. 4. Jesus answered him saying, it is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Yet how could the people live by every word of God if it wasn't available? Here's another verse. Psalms 119, verse 30. Psalms 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Stay tuned for part number two. God bless you.